I want to talk about resurrection today as we continue our series. Now, did you get a wristband on your way in? You did not. Get one on your way out because it is indicative of our series, Fan or Follower. You can take that as a visible reminder of this particular preaching series. And so as we continue our series on Fan or Follower, the premise of this series is for us to cogitate on the question, am I a fan or am I a follower of Jesus Christ? Sometimes, if we're not careful, we will be a fan of the greatest celebrity to ever live, and that's Jesus Christ, and not a follower. And so we want to remind ourselves over these next two or three weeks of the distinction that is made in the Word of God between a fan or a follower. You will notice that I have on a baseball jersey with football emblems on them. Someone said to me last night, that's an interesting jersey, but it's confusing. I said, it is designed to be confusing because sometimes it's confusing between what is a fan and what is a follower. How many of you are University of Memphis Tiger fans? Uh-huh, good. Now on my right side, how many of you are University of Tennessee volunteer fans? Uh-huh. Eli said to me last night, I'll listen to everything you say on the left side of your mouth. I'm not listening to anything you say on the right side of your mouth. I hope you are not that bifurcated. I hope that you are listening to the entire message. No matter which side of my mouth I'm speaking on. Now, I'm a baseball fan, and I love the game. Pastor Freddie last week told us what the definition of a fan, dictionary definition. Let me continue that and expand a bit. So a fan, as you have it there in your bulletin, it has to do with being an enthusiastic um, bystander or an excited admirer or spectator of a person, a place, a team, or a thing. But I'm just a fan. I don't go to practice. I don't get hit. I don't sweat in the heat of the day. I am an enthusiastic bystander and excited admirer. Some of you may not identify with a sports analogy. Let me tell you something else I'm a fan of. I'm a fan of food. <laughs> I love food. I love good home-cooked food, restaurant food. I love food. But I am an enthusiastic bystander. I am simply a consumer. I am an excited admirer. I'm not a committed cook. I'm not a chef. I don't buy it. I don't wash it. I don't mix it. I don't season it. I don't slave over the heat to make sure it's perfect. I just eat it. <laughs> I'm not committed as a cook or a chef, but I am a fan. And if we're not careful, sometimes we will be a fan of the greatest celebrity to ever live, Jesus Christ, rather than a follower. So then what is a follower? It's not in your bulletin. I didn't put it there. So you would write it if you care to. The definition of a follower or a disciple, let me distill it down as easily as I can. It is this, a follower as a gracious and growing imitator of Jesus Christ in these seven major areas of life. A follower is a gracious and growing imitator of Jesus Christ slash in these seven areas of life. Gracious because I'm not perfect and I never will be. I am growing as I am maturing, and I'm not looking down on others with holier than thou. So a follower is a gracious and growing imitator of Jesus Christ, and it impacts these seven 
major areas of life. So if I'm a follower of Jesus, not a fan, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. That's my belief which impact my behavior. I cannot be a believer without it impacting my behavior. I cannot believe in his doctrine without it impacting my duty. I cannot believe in the principles of the word of God without it impacting my practices. So in what areas does it impact? Let me give them to you. One, in my body. Two, in my mind. Three, in my soul, that is the spiritual inner being. Four, in my relationships. Five, in my work, my professional life. Six, in my money or finances. And seven, in my leisure. It impacts all of those areas of life. It will spill over my belief system into my behavior. I'll give them to you again. In my body and my mind, in my soul, the invisible inner part of me, in my relationships, in my work, my professional life, in my money or financial life, and in my leisure. That's the distinction between a fan and a follower. And so we're, we, we have associated and reminded ourselves throughout this series with the Apostles' Creed. How many of you learned the Apostles' Creed at some point in your church life? Raise your hand high if you did. I'm trying to get a gauge. All right, about half of us did and uh, half of us did not. The Apostles' Creed is called the Creed not because it was written by the Apostles, but it was written between the 3rd and 4th century as a collection, a summary, a capsulization of the system of doctrine or beliefs that these apostles held together. Someone has well said that the Apostles' Creed and the way it is written and the way we have been using it for millennia plus hundreds of years is uh, sublime in its simplicity. It is unsurpassed in its brevity, and it is beautiful in its order. And it was written to capture those systems of beliefs that eventually impact behavior. They have been the North Star. They have been the guiding GPS, if you will, of believers across the centuries. So we remind ourselves of it. And so I've asked one of our uh, young people to come, young adults, Anna Albrecht. She is going to come and she is going to quote from memory without any help from me or the screens, the Apostles' Creed because it capsulizes what we believe. Anna, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Yes! Amen. Thank you. Bless you. All right. Now, she did that 115 words without memory. Um, I mean, with memory, no recitation. You can do this very same thing. It is the North Star, the GPS, if you will, of beliefs, which guides my behavior. What I want to focus on in this creed is the phrase resurrection. Five times this creed looks at resurrection. Five times. Why? Because resurrection is the essential element of our faith. Resurrection is the key to 
our faith. And so I want to look at this idea of resurrection. Why was it important? It was important in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll read it in a minute. But this was a question that these new Grecian Jesus followers asked the Apostle Paul. And as a result, he wrote 1 Corinthians 15. He took 58 verses to explain to them the questions they had about life after death. You remember, they were raised in a polytheistic society. They were actually raised believing in the gods of Mount Olympus. They believed in reincarnation. They were saying, now that I'm a Jesus follower, how does that impact my faith after life? And since the centrality of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, how does that impact me today? And so Paul wrote this longest and most thorough treatise in the Word of God about resurrection. You can read it when you get home, 58 verses he teaches us about it. And so I want to read it in your hearing a little longer than we normally read, but bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For I have delivered unto you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, that would be Peter, then to the 12, that would be the original apostles. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren, that would include women as well, at one time most of whom remain until now. That is, they're still alive at the time of this writing. But some have fallen asleep or have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles again. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Because Paul did not walk with Jesus in Palestine, but Jesus appeared to him in bodily form. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins or lost. Then those who have also fallen asleep or died in Christ have also perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are, of all men, all human beings, most to be pitied. If our hope is in this life only, we are to be most pitied. So let me take a moment and look through these seven aspects of the resurrection. I won't comment long on either of them. Well, maybe a couple of them longer than the others. Here's number one. Jesus' death and resurrection was predicted and validated by the Old and New, uh, by the Old Testament Scripture. It was predicted, his resurrection and crucifixion, and validated because it came to pass in the Old Testament scripture. At the time this was written, they, that's all they had. But God had already, even in the Old Testament, revealed this idea of resurrection because Billions of billions of years ago in eternity past, he was preparing for our salvation. And Paul reminds them that this was according to the scriptures because they believed it and it had validity. Here's the second thing about resurrection that he reminded them of. His resurrection, he said, was seen by over 500 
and 13 eyewitnesses. This resurrection after Jesus was crucified, he was seen by over 513 eyewitnesses. We put a lot of stock in eyewitness testimony. For one eyewitness, oftentimes someone will be incarcerated, even life in prison, or even on death row because of eyewitness testimony. 513 plus people saw him, Paul says, and many of them are still alive today. It is their eyewitness testimony. Here's the third thing about the resurrection. Since God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, guess what? He would do the same for us. He's already proven he could do it, and he's promised that he would do it for us. This ought to give us confidence to live life way beyond surviving to thriving, for we have life here on earth as well as a promise to eternity. If God raised Jesus from the dead, and he did, he would do the same for us. Not only did Jesus do it himself, but he gave us a little foretaste, an appetizer, if we will, in the life of Lazarus. In John 11, Jesus had befriended this family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He became very close to them. In fact, when Lazarus died, Jesus wept. That's where we get that verse. He wept because his friend had died. No, he wept even though he knew he would raise him from the dead again. And when Martha and Mary sent word while he was sick, he wasn't dead yet, four days before he died, they sent an immediate message to him and said, Master, would you come and pray for Lazarus? He is sick and is dying. The Bible says Jesus waited intentionally four days so he died first because he wanted to give us an appetizer, a foretaste of his power and resurrection. So when he finally arrived, Lazarus already buried and committed to the ground, he said, take me to the tomb. They went to the tomb and Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Well, even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And I love what Jesus says. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Don't have to wait till the last day, Martha. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Watch this. Do you believe this? That's the question of the day. That's the question of the ages. Jesus was saying to Martha, let me give you an appetizer of who I really am. I don't have to wait till the last day. I am in the present and the future, the resurrection and the life right now. If you believe in me, you will never, ever die. Now, do you believe this? And he raised Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus died again. Four. Without the resurrection, the crucifixion means nothing. Don't lose me. Without the resurrection, the crucifixion means nothing. The crucifixion takes care of our sin problem, but the resurrection takes care of our death problem. Sometimes people say, I don't want to hear about sin. I don't like sin. But I also don't want to hear about death, and I don't like death. But sin and death are inextricably connected. We experience death every single day. Why? Because 
of sin's presence. It is sin that is the cause of every sickness and death. I'm not talking about personal sin. I'm talking about the principle of sin that's been unleashed in our world when Adam and Eve decided to walk independent from God. So it's sin that is the cause of every sickness. Sin is the cause of every death. Sin weaves every shroud. Sin nails every coffin. Sin digs every grave. The crucifixion takes care of the problem of sin, but it is the resurrection that takes the care of the problem of death. If there was no sin, there would be no death. If Jesus had simply died as our substitute and paid our penalty on the cross, but not risen from the dead, it would have meant nothing. If Jesus would not risen from the dead, Paul says, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is also in vain. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still lost in your sins and separation from God. Then those who have already fallen asleep or died in Christ have also perished. There is no hope for them. Five, without the resurrection... We are miserable and without hope in this life or the next. If there were no resurrection, we have lived long enough to know that this world is not our home. So then what is our home? If we believe in this life only, we have hope. Paul says we are of all men and women, most miserable, most to be pitied. But the resurrection gives us hope on earth as well as eternity. Six, his resurrection is validated by the endurance of this 2,000-year-old movement that we call Christianity. No other Religion has impacted positively billions and billions of people in or on this earth. And the sustaining of that movement is because people believe in the resurrection. It has caused them to do sacrificial things. I love this story about Chuck Colson. He writes about why he believes in the resurrection Chuck Colson today is known for the founder of Prison Fellowship. He founded that ministry in 1976, and it remains, though he is now in the presence of God, it remains the largest ministry to those who are incarcerated, the family of those who are incarcerated, and children of incarcerated persons in the world. But long before Prison Fellowship, from 1968, to 1962, Chuck Colson was special legal counsel and so-called hatchet man to then president of the United States, Richard Nixon. Colson was the president's fixer of things that would come back to haunt or to hurt President Nixon. And as a result of his lies and deceit, by his own words, he served seven months in prison for Watergate cover-up related crimes. But several months before he was incarcerated, Coulson converted from being a fan of Jesus Christ to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And he writes these words in his book, Loving God. Coulson states that he believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ for these three reasons. One, he says, first as a lawyer, I believe the Bible is a credible, a most credible and reliable source. So as a lawyer, when the credible source says it, I believe it. Secondly, he says, I believe in the resurrection because the resurrection story, the gospel radically changed my own beliefs and behavior and my own outlook on life. It's the only thing that changed me, not my education or my economics. It was the resurrection. And then thirdly, he says, 
Colson believes in the resurrection, he says, because from my own experience, I know the impossibility of sustaining a cover-up. I like that. <laughs> he says, lifting the transcript from my own experience, a band of five men, myself, Ehrlichman, Haldeman, Mitchell, and Dean, cracked under immense pressure. We were among the most educated, cocky, influential men in 1972 living in the nation's capital with access to virtually unlimited resources, but under the threat of imprisonment as well as financial ruin, we could not cover up a relatively unknown crime like Watergate. So he surmises from his own experience, there is no way that 12 apostles plus key women followers among the most unlettered and uninfluential men and women living in Palestine, very limited access to resources and under tremendous pressure plus the threat of death, there's no way they could cover up the headlining event of their day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I love that. It is that resurrection that makes the difference. I'll give you the last one. Don't lose me. Resurrection is the final proof that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, has power over the strongest enemy of all, death. Our strongest enemy is death. It's not sin. Because sin causes death. It's death. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that he has power over our strongest enemy. And guess what? You know how many of us in here are going to die? I need a power that's stronger than my greatest enemy. Revelation 1, 7 Jesus appeared to John as he was writing this book. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at my feet as dead. But he laid his hand on me, his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was. Are y'all reading with me? I am he who lives but was. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the, I like, the keys of Hades and of death, that is the grave and death. Write these things down that you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Jesus says, not only am I the resurrection and the life, but I was dead. There's nobody else who claims to be Savior that can say that, that I was dead. Everybody else who claims to be a Savior and a prophet, they already are dead, bones bleaching white, somewhere deep down in the dark couch of nature's night. The only one who has said that I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've got the keys to the grave and to death. I will unlock it anytime I want. I almost feel like preaching. So therefore, the Apostle Paul says this as he closes this long treatise on resurrection. Therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, knowing, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? Because of the power of the resurrection. He got up and so will I. Pray with me if you would. Mm. Oh, gracious God, our Father, here we are. Somebody is here today who's been a fan, a bystander, a spectator of the greatest celebrity to ever live, a consumer, not a participant. And today, they can get in the game. You brought them here for that reason. So I pray that you would help 
them to make the conversion because of your grace and your power and your spirit and your word to become a follower, a growing and gracious imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they're here today, we want them to know that someone will walk with them. Our prayer room is available. At the end of this worship, on the other side of that big information booth, people are waiting there to lead them into a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And for those of us who already have that relationship, would you help us to evaluate our growing and gracious imitation of you in these major areas of life? Am I a fan or follower when it comes to my body, my mind, my soul, my spiritual disciplines? When it comes to my relationships or my work and professional life, my money and how I treat my financial resources and my leisure. Thank you for reminding us about the resurrection and that you have conquered our strongest enemy, death. Therefore, help us to live life with courage, with gusto, with hope. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Hey, stand if you would. I said our benediction would be the Apostles' Creed, and we are going to read it with vim, with vigor, and vitality. vitality. <laughs> hope, what do we believe? I, stop. We're going to read it with vim, vigor, and read it like you believe it. Let's read. What do we believe? I and I believe in who was con born of the he was the third day he he ascended to heaven and is seated at the from there I believe in the holy the resurrection of the body touch at least six people before you leave